Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. It's one thing to listen to doom and gloom about food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. It's quite another thing to hear practical, immediately actionable advice from experts who can help you reduce the fear, anxiety, and burden of these problems. Tune in now to the Surviving Hard Times podcast from the Finding Genius Foundation with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Surviving Hard Times podcast. I have uh, Juan Carlos Diaz Perez, PhD. He's a professor in uh, the Department of Horticulture at University of Georgia. And we're going to talk about his research into uh, vegetables and, uh, and growing. So, Juan, thank you for coming. Well, thank you, Richard, for the invitation. I'm happy to be with you. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your history. How did you get into working with, uh, with growing and horticulture? Oh, that goes all the way back to my uh, young years in Guadalajara, Mexico in which uh, I used to have a garden with my parents uh, and we grew all kinds of uh, fruit trees. I think my passion for agriculture started there. We grew all kinds of uh, some tropical and subtropical trees. That's where the whole thing started. Oh, very cool. And what about today in your research? Are you working on fruit trees or vegetables or what's your focus? Well, during my career, I have done some work on uh, particularly tropical fruit, but right now in my current position at the University of Georgia, I work on vegetable production. All different okay. vegetables from uh, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, onions, watermelon, you name it. <laughs> okay. Yes, Richard. So what are, what are some of the main questions that you're trying to answer with your research right now? What we're trying to do is to find ways to improve uh, crop production, but uh, in uh, environmentally or some sustainable way from the environmental point of view, to be to the less aggressive to the environment. That's at least what I'm trying to do. So basically, in, okay. in, in few words, it's a sustainable horticultural production. So what does that mean? What, what are some of the inputs that are needed the most that you think, uh, you know, affects the environment adversely? Oh, okay. Well, there are different challenges we are living right now. One of them is um, climate change. We, uh, you know, this increases in temperature that are affecting crops as well as human beings. And uh, one of the things we do to deal with that is to employ plastics, agroplastics, uh, plastics in agriculture, play an important role in helping us uh, modify the um, crop environment in ways to help us uh, create or modify conditions to more favor favorable for the crop, in particularly temperature in the soil, as well as uh, maintaining um, soil moisture at the right levels, as well as other benefits such as uh, controlling weeds, and uh, maintaining the crop uh, cleaner, not being directly in contact with the soil. Those are just a few of the benefits of using plastics. There is one application that is called plastic mulch. 
This mulch is applied to the soil as a strip and plants are placed on top of it. That's what I was referring to, you know, having a plastic film that is going to modify the, particularly the root microenvironment for the plant. What do you mean? What is plastic mulch? Is it just a layer of plastic that the plants poke up through or what does it look like? A plastic mulch is a plastic film. Plants are um, established on top of that strip of plastic. What I want to clarify is that uh, we were talking about sustainability. Um, the use of plastics certainly poses challenges and uh, we can view this use of plastic in different ways. Plastics provide us a lot of benefits, which ultimately give us uh, improved yield and quality. But one of the issues with the use of plastics is the disposal. That's a challenge, not only in agriculture, but I would say in the normal life or in all societies. Right now, there is a lot of research trying to find ways to dispose of this plastic and in, in, in such a way to be more sustainable. And that's where I, where I come to the sustainability issue. What are we doing right now? Well, with respect to the use of plastics, there are a few approaches you can take. One, or let me, let me, before I do that, let me tell you what happens. When we grow crops on these plastic mulches, at the end of the season or sometimes at the end of the second or third season, because plastic mulches may be reused for different crops. Once we've terminated the use of this plastic mulch, we have to remove it from the field. The plastic mulch is usually covered with soil and pesticides. So what happens to this plastic? One is that it can be taken to the landfill, which is a relatively common way to deal with this plastic and which is also not very sustainable. But unfortunately, oftentimes that is the case. Another option is uh, that people could even burn it. That is still not very sustainable. So what, what can we do? Well, in a relatively small fraction of the use of this plastic film is to collect it from the field wash it and use it for um, recycling to do pellets and, and do some reuse of that plastic. That's an approach that is being by some groups and in the US and um, particularly, I would say more in Europe, uh, places like uh, France and Germany are pretty much interest in developing this type of uh, collection of plastic to enhance sustainability. In the US, uh, we are working on it, trying to uh, improve that collection, but there are challenges uh, in the US that Europe doesn't have, uh, you know, such as U the US is a very large country, but I would say at the regional level, those are possibilities. And uh, the plastic industry, oh. I am aware, is interested in, in considering this option, but uh, still, this is still at the incipient stage to my well, why use Why use plastic mulch at all? Why not use wood chips or other kind of mulches? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I, we have done research using organic mulches too. Uh, I should uh, again insist that uh, the plastic mulches offer these um, benefits such as uh, increasing the temperature of the soil. That's something you cannot get with organic mulches. If you use wheat straw, wood chips, etc., you typically end up in reducing the soil temperature or maintaining soil temperature. With the plastic mulch, you can increase soil temperature, especially if the plastic mulch is black. So changing the color of the plastic, you can provide different levels of uh, soil heating, which in turn can provide different effects on the crops. That is one aspect that um, is of a particular application with respect to plastic mulch. And also- well, why, not, um, why not take um, wood chip mulch and char some of it, and the blackened char would maybe act as similar to black, uh, black plastic. And maybe you spread some soot over the mulch 
and the uh, black particulates mixed in with it maybe would raise the soil temperature enough? Good, good question. Uh, yes, I, I am very open and I support all, all these possibilities. Never, I don't recall any studies testing for that, whether there is an, you know, that this temperature effect can be obtained, but it, I think it's an interesting idea. I think it's worth looking at. Yeah, the reason why I say it is um, I've seen, you know, I've been to Iceland, I've seen icebergs and they have soot on some of the ice and some of the snow and it helps it melt faster because it's black. You know, the snow is white and it reflects a lot of sunlight, but the soot that comes from the local volcanoes makes it melt a lot faster. So that's why I thought for the, the mulch it may help too. Well, it is an interesting idea, Richard. I, I think that might be something to look at, you know, using charcoal or some sort of a other type of material might be interesting and charcoal can be used also it is used as a means to provide some uh, some nutrients when when this, this incineration of uh, plant materials are used as a fertilizer or soil amendment so yes th this type of our ideas are aspects that need to be evaluated we need to be open to possibilities but the reality is, uh, Richard, that um, the plastic is going to be used for a while. And it's not that I think we should all the time, but it, it has a lot of benefits. And I think uh, having ways to better dispose of it would be useful. But definitely looking at other possibilities is also a, a, an option I think we should consider. So what happens to the plastic after a season? It's it's pulled up and then what's wrong with it? It has holes in it or are there other problems with it? Is it degraded by the sun? What, what's, why can't it be reused easily? Plastic, um, it depends on where you are in the country. But in general, after the first season, uh, it has holes, um, as you can expect from the stem of the plants. And sometimes there are uh, cracks that appear by just by the use, mechanical damage on the plastic film and so forth. In Georgia, where I am located, growers reuse it two or three times. I mean, two times more, and they plant a different crop. For instance, they can start the first planting can be tomatoes, second planting can be cucumbers, and the third planting may be broccoli. So after the, third, the, the last crop is there, the plastic mulch is removed. Is removed and... Uh, Again, the the routes for that plastic, it's either the landfill or sometimes growers accumulate the plastic mulch in piles in some area of their fields and that's and they just stay there for who knows how long. Mm. And okay. some growers can even burn it. I mean that's that's really a challenge, yes, but that's that's the way it is right now. Well, what's the point of the plastic? I mean, like you said, it'll, it sounds like a season extender. As it gets cooler, it'll keep the ground warmer. Or in places where the ground never gets that warm, it'll, I guess it'll keep it warmer. Uh, does it also keep out weeds? You know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be breathe, breathable. Yes. So what does it do to the microclimate of the soil if it's now no, it's no longer in contact with the air? I mean, the, the bacterial mix, I think, would change because it's more anaerobic. So what effects does it have on the plants and the soil? I don't think we have problems with anaerobiosis, at least not very evident. Uh, there's sufficient uh, air circulation from the sides. I haven't seen problems with anaerobiosis. Uh, one big, uh, another benefit of using plastic mulch is soil moisture retention and weed control. Those two are really important. When you have a plastic mulch, you have a very high percentage of weed control and you also retain a lot of the soil moisture, you reduce soil evaporation. So those two are very important benefits. And, and, and in general, a lot, of, a lot of the studies show that in the field, when you use this plastic mulch, you have uh, increases in yield. That's, that's what the data show. Because of all these benefits I just mentioned, Richard. I should, I should whoa, whoa, whoa. have to, what, yes, what benefits? So the soil temperature is warmer, but what are the other benefits? Again, weed control, or what are the other benefits of it? Well, it's weed control, and let me explain that effect of uh, temperature. Early in the season, sometime in early in the spring, the temperatures are cool. When you increase the soil temperature, you stimulate root growth and plant growth. That results in a faster 
crop establishment and enhance plant growth. That, that has an important effect in resulting in better developed plants with the higher fruit yields. There's a lot of data showing that. That is the effect you get in the, in the spring. And that effect again has been appreciated or observed in many areas of, uh, of the country. I would say of the world, but it, of course it depends on when you are for the type of uh, the effect uh, temperature will have. But uh, let me tell you another another issue. In the summer in South Georgia, where I am located, temperatures get very high. Then it's an early season extender. Is that why the yields are increased or what's the reason? Yes, you can see it that way, some sort of a season extender. But at the same time, the crop produces more, improves, uh, you know, you have a better soil moisture status in the soil. You have uh, improved nutrient uptake and uh, it reduces some nutrient leaching in soils like uh, those we have uh, in Georgia because it covers the soil uh, and if it rains a lot, you have uh, less uh, nutrient leaching. So there are some benefits associated with the use of plastic mulch, of this impermeable layer. Um, some of those effects ha can be replaced by using organic mulches, but some others cannot. Y using organic mulches gives you benefits too, and, and it gives you other benefits you don't get with plastic. Ultimately, it depends on the type of uh, benefit you want, you may end up using plastic or organic mulch. Both are good, but depending on, on the region, on the crop, and what you expect by using it. One negative aspect of not using, of using plastic is that uh, you don't improve the soil quality. If you use organic mulch, you can improve soil quality. So it's not an easy answer, Richard. There are uh, pros and cons and different effects you get depending on the type of mulch you use. Well, what are some of the other common mulches? I guess wood chips, uh, plastic, what else? Well, you can, you can uh, in general, call them, uh, you can have the plastic mulch and wood mulches on the other. And you have so many types of organic mulches. Where, and with respect to the plastic, you have plastics made out of, from, derived from the oil industry. And there is another option, Richard. That is the some sort of a biodegradable mulch or degradable mulch. These biodegradable mulches is an option that has also been considered since several years ago, but particularly in the last few years. And that's an option that may help in or may contribute to provide some alternatives to the use of uh, polymeric films like uh, polyethylene. These big biodegradable mulches are not used a lot, but uh, their use is increasing, slowly but increasing, in my opinion. These With mulches, plastic mulch, do you, quick question, do you, do you put it right on the surface or do you put um, the mulch on the surface and then put a little bit of dirt on top of it? Would that help at all or would that make no difference if you put like maybe a, you know, a centimeter or two of dirt covering the plastic mulch? No, 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 no. You need to leave the the mulch completely exposed. What you do is you make some um, what we call beds are basically strips of uh, about uh, could be 40 inches wide, 60 inches wide, and they are about four to six inches high. These strips of soil is where you grow the crop. They are called beds, B-E-D, bed. You cover that bed with the plastic film and uh, you establish the crop. You plant on top of the film that is covering the bed. That's how you do it. And you can also insert drip tape under the film that is located on, on the surface of the soil. But if you cover the film with the soil, then you are completely nulling or neutralizing the um, optical effect of the film in terms of uh, it's not going to provide any warming at all because it's completely covered. The whole idea... Well, I thought if you, just, if, you, if you just do a little bit of it, I thought maybe it would act as an insulator, you know, and then maybe it reduces some of the sun damage to the plastic. If you have just, let's say, like one centimeter of soil above it, you know, a tiny bit just to barely cover it. But it, has anyone tested that? Would it still work or no? I have never read somebody doing that. 
I, I think, uh, Rich, the main benefit of uh, of the mulch is one of the main benefits. It's its optical properties, its ability to modify the light coming to the crop or to the soil around the crop. So that's why it is left uncovered. Certainly, if you look at the effect on soil moisture retention, yes, still, if you put some soil on top of the mulch, you will still get the soil moisture retention. That That's basically how I see it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I just, you know, it, I'm an armchair, these mulches, uh, armchair yeah. gardener here. I'm just thinking of ideas. Yeah. No, no, that's good. You know, these mulches, one of the things they do when they manufacture them is they prov- they apply in the components of the plastic some compounds that are that have some uh, anti ultraviolet light uh, protection so in such a way that the, this ultraviolet does not deteriorate deteriorate the plastic so quickly so they can provide some materials on the plastic to help it with ultraviolet damage in the field it gotcha. is used Quite a bit, uh, Richard, and again, I've seen a lot of the benefits, but I'm also concerned that we should not keep using this plastic as we are. Again, I will summarize what I have told you. We have to find ways to better dispose of it because the reality is we are still using it. And second is that find ways to collect it and recycle it. And another option is to increase the use of these biodegradable materials as the technology allows us to improve the quality of these biodegradable mulches. So these these are some of the possibilities uh, we are seeing in horticultural production, Richard. Well, what what makes the the biodegradable mulches biodegradable? Like, do they die after one season? Is it the sun that disassociates them or how do they degrade? They are composed of... uh, organic materials and some of them are made out of starch for instance or some other uh, organic uh, compounds but starch is one of them that that can be like a raw material so once they are in the soil these uh, biodegradable mulches mulches by being made out of organic materials they are decomposed by the bacteria in the soil so ultimately they can be 90 95 percent decomposed when they when they are buried in the soil, they are not. I would say majority of them are not hundred percent biodegradable. They still contain some components that are not uh, that may remain in the soil more than one year or so. They are not hundred percent biodegradable, and that's uh, where a lot of research is being done right now to improve the how degradable they are to be fully accepted as a hundred percent biodegradable we're still not there yet well would you compost these or what's some of the them, most effective way to degrade them very good question some of them are, are sold as compostable materials but they are not hundred percent biodegradable to my knowledge there are still a small percentage of the material that remains longer it takes longer to decompose it has to do with this uh, chemical composition when so, you say they don't fully degrade what do, what do they turn into what's left of them i would say i'm not uh, very familiar with the chemistry of the but basically you would say something that uh, is a hundred percent compostable should turn into basic compounds like co2 water maybe some minerals after a relatively short period of time let's say of about one year if it doesn't, then that's what I am referring to, to not being 100% compostable, not at least in a short time. They may take much longer to decompose completely. We're talking about intermediate compounds that do not degrade so easily. That's what I'm talking about. Are any of these compounds useful or are they harmful, the intermediate compounds that some of these would break down into? That's a very good question. Uh, Sometimes it's not fully understood, Richard. There is some research on it, uh, but we still, at least that I know of, we still don't have all the data to see the environmental impact of some of these compounds that remain 
longer periods of time after the application of the biodegradable mulches. It may depend on the material too, because each biodegradable mulch is composed of different materials. So it varies from one mulch to the other. Hmm, okay. Um, in addition to the mulches, what, uh, what other technology are you looking at for sustainability and growing? I've been testing um, the use of uh, shade nets to provide some partial shading to the crops as a way to reduce heat stress on the crop. This has been in showing some interesting responses, and uh, uh, I would say uh, very positive responses in crops such as bell pepper. By shading the crop certain times of the season, like particularly during the months of May, June, July, August, you can uh, allow the crop to grow better and produce better. That type of technology is not used very much in Georgia, but uh, it's currently used in other countries, really, you know, in places like Central America, Mexico, Israel, Spain. They use this shading technology. We have data in Georgia showing that it has potential, but at this point it has not been adopted for practical or for uh, commercial production. But I've been getting the data in case you know we need to move ahead in a more extended way to help the growers. Well, why wouldn't shade? I mean, that seems very basic. Why wouldn't shade cloth be used? Is it just to reduce the? Uh, is it block just part of the sunlight that's incident upon the plants in the fields, or like what are the different uses of shade cloth? Well, the black shade cloth basically you are reducing infrared radiation and and also some visible light. So you're reducing the light level on the crop, and that helps to lower the temperature on the plant canopy. That helps and reduces, we can say, it reduces the heat stress on the crop. There are other uh, technologies that uh, include the use not just of the black shade net, but there are other colors of shade net that provide different effects. For instance, you can have a, a white shade net that provides additional cooling compared to the black shade net. Or there are other shade nets that are, for instance, red that uh, modify the... Um, light quality compared to just simply using black in such a way that you can obtain certain effects by, by changing uh, the quality of uh, certain light spectra. Certain portions of the light spectra are shifted into another portions of the light spectrum so um, to, to get uh, certain uh, b biological responses. Basically changing the light quality. That's what you get when you use is like the red shade net. So this is, uh, this is, has shown some interesting applications, particularly in the ornamental industry, where people are interested in getting a, a, like a larger leaf size in certain ornamental plants, or they are interested in getting a, a certain type of flowering responses. The color of the shade net can help you enhance those responses. Richard? Oh, so what are some of the common colors? Is there a green one or red or like what, what are the, you know, what wavelengths really aren't critical to the plants that maybe would cause overheating? I've seen like indoors, you know, with hydroponics that they use like red and blue lamps, LEDs, and, you know, some use full spectrum. But again, I guess some of the shade cloths would get rid of the, um, the frequencies of light that really aren't used in the ornamental industry, Richard, they sell different colors. They sell, in addition to black and white, they also sell one that is silver, which is intended to provide some cooling effect. And they also sell the red, they sell blue. And uh, I haven't done a lot of research in ornamental production to tell you which one uh, produces specifically what type of effect. I'm, this is, I'm just talking about certain research I am familiar with, but uh, I have tested some different colors like red, white, and silver in um, different types of peppers and some in squash. And what we found is basically that uh, the main effect we get, Richard, is a reduction in temperature of the plant canopy. And that helps cool the plants and allow them to uh, 
thrive in a high temperature condition environment compared to plants that are fully exposed to the sunlight. Sunlight. It's basically the well, cooling, cooling and shading effect, regardless of the color. That's what my data well, show. But there are yeah, but, many mean, other if, studies. If we look at sunlight in the early part of the day, you know, the color temperature is different from sunlight in the afternoon. So, you know, if you want a shade cloth that's really only active in the early part of the day or the later part of the day, I'm sure that can be figured out by looking at the color temperature of the light that's coming in on your fields, you know? Well, typically, um, the shade nets are used on once they are established in the field and they use certain instructions to support the these nets. Mm, you just leave them on the crop until you decide to take them out. You know, it's not usually designed to put them like a fraction of the day and then remove it. Uh, although I think like a small grower could do are some technologies mm. that are more sophisticated. It's some sort of a greenhouse type of a technology that uh, um, has the ability to open the roof of the structure of the greenhouse or even put some shade net on top of the plants depending on some monitoring of the air temperature and light you are doing in your structure in your greenhouse so this greenhouse in short then is can open and close and can extend a shade net or remove the shade net depending on the need of the crop and also in response to a given environmental conditions Mm. That's more, that's a more sophisticated type of growing system, but uh, they, there are commercially available greenhouses who, that can do that. Right, but it, what if you had a shade cloth that only let through polarized light? You know, what would that do? Or again, um, the sun in the morning in a particular area may have, again, a lot, you know, a much higher color temperature than later on. So depending on the color of the shade cloth, um, all the rays may go straight through and only later in the day, let's say, would they be blocked, you know, certain frequencies of light. So I'm sure people can make those kinds of things and get pretty sophisticated about it. You know? You're talking about like, an, a, it, it's a very good point, Richard. I, I don't think we have the technology, but there are something similar to that. There are, this is a concept of more like an intelligent film that is able to respond and adapt. Uh, right now, I don't think we have any majority of the shade nets are not uh, able to do that. I mean, that would be great, mm. a type of yeah. um, net that uh, responds depending on the needs. But uh, there are some recent developments on, it's not shade net, but it's some type of a film um, that you put in the greenhouse. So you can put it in, in high tunnels. You put it on the top of the structure. And this um, material has the ability to shift the light spectrum in, in such a way to put it at uh, certain wavelengths that allow the plant to have uh, light at that wavelength that is more easily used for photosynthesis. This is a new type of development of film and there are companies working on this, this type of uh, ability to move the light or, or to change the light spectrum to make it more efficiently available for the crop. That's sort of uh, where research is going, which in a way is what you're saying, Richard. But mm. we're on, on the practice in the f open field, we don't have that yet, to my knowledge. There are, yeah, however, interesting... I say, that, let me tell okay. you this, there are some films that have the ability to remove more infrared. These are commercially available materials, and these are used in high tunnels and greenhouse. They remove a significant amount of infrared light, they have materials in the film that, that do that. So yes, there's some partial uh, modification of the light when light goes through those films. Hmm. Yeah, imagine if you could look at common weeds and create a film that would block, let's say, one, one a couple of critical wavelengths that weeds would use, but not the plants you're growing. You know, that would be very interesting too. Well, that might help you, you get rid of them. You may want to hear this. Uh, there are some films that have uh, the ability to block ultraviolet light. Mm. This is used a lot in greenhouses. These films, by blocking ultraviolet light, they make some insects have a, an uncontrolled behavior because some insects use ultraviolet light 
as a way to get orientation. So mm. they don't have the ultraviolet light. They don't function so well. So, so these are some of the benefits of, uh, of these new technologies. And all this is plastic again. Yeah. So, so you can see it's not so, yeah, and we don't have uh, alternatives for this type of developments with materials that are not plastic. I wish there were, but we are, we don't. Also with plastics, I mean, you know, they abrade and they create microplastics. So I don't know if people are looking to see if plants grow in with plastic mulch, how much of the plastic goes into the plants and essentially that contaminates them. And the plastic staying resident in the plants that we consume. I don't recall any studies on that, uh, Richard. I know there are what? Yes, the problem of plastics is there, um, but with respect to absorption of the plastic, I'm, I don't know. There may be some, but uh, not to my knowledge. I know these microplastics are particularly a big problem in China, but let me see if I can explain that. Um, in China, they use a plastic mulch that is very thin, probably one-third or one-fourth the thickness of the one we use in the U.S., that plastic film they use in China is cheaper because it's so thin and that's why they use it so much. But such a thin plastic results in um, fragmentation that results in these microplastics and, and you can see fields in China where small pieces of plastic mulch are there. It's not so bad that problem in the US because we use a film that since it is thicker, we have less problems in picking it up. I mean, there are still some fragments that may remain mm. in the field, mm. but nothing mm. comparable to what is going on in China. In China, it's a real environmental issue. Very serious. No, so it's so it's so thin that just even picking it up off the field would would uh, it would just tear to pieces and pieces would right. be left behind. Correct. I see. Correct. Interesting. I wonder if they can create a backing like a very thin backing, and then you could use natural materials like compost or even dirt to adhere to the backing and make a, a mulch that's partially organic and partially with this, maybe this degradable backing, like a, a starch, sticky backing that something could be, uh, you know, again, adhered to it to make a temporary uh, cover. Mulches made out of organic materials, compost and all that are good materials. Uh, but again, it depends on what you are looking for. Like, you know, the use of organic mulches, uh, depending on the source, uh, can be, can pose challenges in addition to the great benefits. What are the great benefits? Well, you get organic matter. You can improve soil quality uh, in many ways by providing food to the microbes that are in the soil, which is very good for your soil. Uh, you can improve soil structure. Uh, which results in a better water holding capacity, better porosity. So yes, you get a lot of good benefits with organic mulches and organic um, amendments. But there are also some challenges. You have to be careful with the type of uh, organic material you're using. For instance, uh, if you use wheat straw, we have uh, some data showing that using wheat straw with uh, cucurbits like uh, squash, can uh, result in uh, reduced plant growth. We have seen the same effect mm. in, in onion. And one of the reasons for this reduced crop growth is that uh, these organic mulches uh, is decompose in the field. And for decomposition to occur, the bacteria use some of the nitrogen that is in the soil, which end up competing for nitrogen with the crop. So sometimes mm. the crops look... Uh, uh, smaller or even yellow, we call them chlorotic. They look yellow because they may have uh, nitrogen deficient conditions because the bacteria are using a lot of the nitrogen to decompose the wheat straw or some other mulch. So the use of organic mulches is wonderful, but we have to understand the challenges of uh, the mulch we are applying. It's mm -hmm. not so clear cut. Yeah, that no, makes sense. Well, very good one. Um... What's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go to find you? Well, they can go to the website of my department, uh, uga.edu slash uh, horticulture. And uh, they can see not just my work. You can, they can see the work of my colleagues. And that would be a good, good way to, to see what we are doing in Georgia. Okay. Well, very good. 
Well, Juan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and being patient with my questions. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Richard. Thank you for letting me talk. Before you stop listening, ask yourself, what are one or two useful things you heard on this podcast that can help you overcome food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation? Please like and subscribe and tell your friends and family about their Surviving Hard Times podcast. We're all going to need help now and in the near future.